G'day, I'm Stephen Page from Page Probe and Family and Fertility Lawyers and in a recent series of videos, and this is the second one, I'm talking about adoption. As everyone knows that um, I, I do surrogacy work, but for about the last 20 or 30 years, of, I hate to say I've lost count of how many years, um, I've done adoption work. And most family lawyers don't know adoption if they fell over it. And that's not being a criticism, it's just adoptions in Australia now are comparatively rare. Uh, so I've previously talked about how the 1993 Hague Intercountry Adoption Convention works. Um, and, but I'm not going to cover that in this video. This video I'm talking about uh, something more specific, which is two countries, which are South Korea and Taiwan. Uh, so Australia has, uh, if, if you do an adoption overseas, you fit into one of three categories and that depends on what type of country you're in uh, or as the Chinese would say, what jurisdiction you're in. Uh, because there are uh, countries which are parties to the 1993 Hague Intercountry Adoption Convention along with Australia. Then there are countries that are non-Hague countries. Uh, for example, uh, Singapore uh, or Samoa. Uh, and then there are two countries which are non-Hague countries, but they have separate agreements uh, with Australia. And those two countries, or again, as I said, the Chinese would say, jurisdictions, uh, South Korea or the Republic of Korea um, and Taiwan. So these are what are called bilateral countries. And uh, under the Family Law Act, there are regulations uh, covering uh, adoptions occurring in uh, these um, bilateral countries. Uh, and under the migration regulations, uh, if an adoption has occurred of a child either over there, uh, in accordance with the uh, bilateral regulations, those family law um, adoption bilateral regulations, or um, occurred here, uh, again in accordance with that process, uh, then uh, the adoption is approved. So there has been very small numbers uh, of children adopted uh, from each of these um, jurisdictions, South Korea and Taiwan, uh, but uh, in essence you will need to work with the State or Territory Adoption Authority uh, and be eligible through them and they in turn will reach out to South Korean or Taiwanese um, officials once children are available. Uh, I can't say that I can hold out much hope but occasionally children um, are made available for adoption um, from overseas. Uh, the typical uh, reaction I have um, from clients who come to me talking about surrogacy is that they've previously attended uh, a seminar of some kind held by one of the states uh, or territory uh, adoption authorities or uh, adoption providers and said, well, there are no children. So that, that is a depressing um, part of it, unfortunately, but occasionally there will be children available either from South Korea or Taiwan and you will either go through a court process uh, in South Korea or Taiwan and have the adoption approved there and because it will also be in compliance with those regulations and approved by the state authority here therefore you'll fall within the migration regulations or and we see this particularly in New South Wales that you will have to go through the state court here and get the adoption order made here and New South Wales is particularly tricky because uh, its Adoption Act uh, mirrors in part the bilateral regulations. It seems to be the most difficult of the states dealing with the bilateral regulations. So what does it all say? If you fit within this scope that you might be considering adoption from uh, South Korea or Taiwan, it, you would be wise to get expert legal advice. Uh, here to make sure that your journey is as quick uh, and as cheap and as stress-free as it possibly can be. Um, that doesn't mean that your journey will be quick, cheap and stress-free. It will likely not be any of those, but 
getting that advice at the beginning so you know where the guideposts are and know where the journey ahead uh, is going to go, I think is vital. Thank you.